Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's nice to see you all. It's good to be back. Um, this is going to be a great session. I don't recall anything quite like it before. There's been a lot of interest in the kind of three-year hiatus of scientific meetings that has emerged about exercise and myotonic dystrophy. It's always, there's always been interest, but now it's really been ramped up. Um, and so we, we have a great session, I think, devoted to that topic. It, it, at least it's a start, it's a big topic. And we're gonna have, start with some um, work involving animal models, uh, a couple of recent, um, studies and patients that were both very important, and then uh, finish off with some uh, remarks from Tina Duong about um, how, how, you know, what the overall implications of this, how this can be applied in practice and also the impact of it on um, future clinical research and trials in particular. So um, that said, let's get started with our first presentation by uh, Tom Cooper about exercise in a mouse model. Thank you, Charles, and it's a, a thrill to be here and to see everybody in 3D. It's it's just fantastic, uh, and to see you you know below this level as well is really is really great. Uh, so um, <clears throat> careful interpreting that, I guess. Um, uh, so what I'll be talking about is a study we did with a HSA long repeat mice uh, a number of years ago. So let me start. by making a noise, wait a minute, let me get on here. There we go. Start with the disclosures at first. Uh, and I also wanted to start off with uh, saying thanks to the people who did the work. Uh, Lydia Sharp was a clinician who was in the lab at the time. She's now, a, uh, she's a faculty member at Baylor College of Medicine in the neurology department. And she was helped by a graduate student who's now graduated, Diana Cox, is now gainfully employed in, in biotech. And so this was a study, again, done about four and a half, uh, five years ago. And at the time, there wasn't a lot known about what the effect of, was of exercise in myotonic dystrophy. And I'll be focusing here on uh, DM1. And as Charles alluded to, and as you'll see, there's a great deal known now, which is actually quite interesting. And we had a very simple question, and that was, is exercise uh, detrimental uh, to skeletal muscle uh, in myotonic dystrophy? But uh, since I am the first speaker, I wanted to start off with a few uh, uh, points to put it into context so that we're all thinking in the same, uh, the same vein. Um, and I think um, the first point I wanted to make was a reminder that myotonic dystrophy is a multi-systemic disease. And that is, that's very relevant as we think about this disease. For, for those of you who do the treatments uh, of the patients, how to manage the patients, uh, and in terms of exercise, when we think of individuals doing exercise, um, it isn't just the skeletal muscle. Uh, is it also good for the heart? Is it detrimental to heart? Uh, what about for the CNS and for the other, the other tissues that are involved? And it also will come down to therapies. Uh, we're at a very exciting time now with thinking about uh, therapeutic, uh, therapeutics with some clinical trials uh, ongoing. Um, will the therapies hit all tissues? Will they be beneficial to some? And uh, not as much uh, for others. So again, just something to put it into context. And I also want to go through the, the, some of the molecular biology of the disease. Again, this will be relevant to some of the things that I'll talk about during this talk as well. Uh, and of course, we know a great deal about the mechanism of the disease. It's autosomal dominant, which tells you that uh, there's one affected allele, um, that either it's a haploinsufficiency or it's a gain of function of some kind. And clearly we know it's a gain of function and particularly uh, of the RNA uh, from the expanded allele that has the long tracks of uh, CUG repeats. Uh, and that RNA then gets stuck in the foci uh, uh, detected here by in situ hybridization and causes a gain of function. So what does that mean, an RNA gain of function? Well, there are a lot of potential mechanisms uh, that are involved and potential uh, that are contributing, um, in most cases, unknown uh, contributions to uh, the disease. And again, since it's multisystemic, you can imagine it may be different in different tissues. Okay. <laughs> um, but what uh, I will focus on is 
particularly the RNA binding proteins that are affected, and uh, particularly the muscle blind uh, paralogs, muscle blind one and muscle blind two, which appear to be their, their loss of function, their sequestration on the repeat RNA uh, is, appears to be the predominant uh, mechanism of pathogenesis. And all these RNA binding proteins that have been shown to be affected in myotonic dystrophy. Um, you know, I also like to point out that it was Maury Swanson who actually was involved in the, in the discovery of all these uh, different, uh, different RNA binding proteins and their effect in myotonic dystrophy. But all these RNA binding proteins affect different aspects of uh, RNA processing. Um, but where the focus has been is on uh, disrupted uh, regulation of uh, alternative splicing and more about that. Oh, first I wanted to show you um, sequestration of muscle blind. And I think this is also a very important point. And this is a, a, some work done by Charles uh, several years ago. So we talk about muscle blind being co-localized with the RNA foci. What's really important is it's not just co-localized, it is sequestered on those foci. And I think this slide shows that very nicely. So this is a cardiomyocyte from individuals with myotonic dystrophy. This is a nucleus of the cell that's stained with DAPI. Let's go over here. This is in situ hybridization showing the RNA, uh, the repeat RNA uh, detected by probes to the CUG repeats. You can see it's in these foci. And then if you stain for the protein muscle blind uh, one, you can see that there's co-localization. But again, if you look at the distribution of muscle blind normally in a cardiomyocyte uh, nucleus, you can see that there really is not just co-localization. There's a depletion uh, from the nucleoplasm. I and mean, if I remember right, uh, Charles calculated that it's about a two to 2.3 fold loss of nucleoplasmic uh, muscle blind. Uh, and so that's the loss of function of, of muscle blind that's important. I also wanted to put it into the context of something that the study of myotonic dystrophy taught us about normal development and particularly normal postnatal development. Um, and, uh, and that is that there are networks of alternative splicing transitions that are taking place from, uh, let's say, from birth in different tissues uh, into the adult. And so postnatal development is actually an understudied and very interesting period of development when the tissues are remodeling from the fetal functions to the adult functions. And my favorite example is if you think about a newborn baby. And walk, not being able, you know, the muscle function is uh, is not very good. But when that baby can start walking and the muscle function has improved, then you start to you need to baby proof the house. Um, so that's quite a transition, a remodeling of the tissue. Of course, there's transcriptional changes that are taking place, networks of genes going up and down. There's also alternative splicing changes taking place that change the reading frame of proteins from fetal protein isoforms to adult protein isoforms. And what's Yep. What's happening in myotonic dystrophy is that a subset of that network, and particularly those that are regulated by muscle blind and some of those other proteins, SELF1, probably HNRPA1, uh, fail to transition to the adult uh, splicing patterns. And so they, the adult tissues are expressing these fetal isoforms uh, that can't fulfill the functions of adult muscle. Uh, and so that is responsible for uh, at least many features of the disease. And there may be other things going on, but this is what's been uh, characterized. In particular, the, the muscle-specific chloride channel, the failure to express the adult isoform is responsible for uh, myotonia. And then I've highlighted some of the other genes that, that are implicated uh, in uh, muscle disease. Also, SCN5A uh, is a, a voltage-dependent sodium channel that's strongly implicated in the arrhythmias. Uh, in myotonic dystrophy uh, cardiac tissue. And so we'll be talking more about alternative splicing. And I just wanted to show you this. This is an RNA-seq uh, data from uh, the CIRCA-1 gene. Uh, and these are four um, uh, RNA from uh, individuals, skeletal muscle from individuals uh, that are not affected with the disease. And this is these are the annotated exons. So the RNA-seq uh, piles up on these exons. And so you can really tell the level of exon inclusion and use of that exon uh, by uh, the basically the height of this peak here. So you can see this, this is the exon that's important. And you can see that it's a, nearly 100% used in individuals without the disease. But in myotonic dystrophy, you can see that it is predominantly uh, not used. It actually changes the C-terminus of the protein. So this does change uh, the protein. Okay. So back to uh, exercise and, and what we did uh, several years ago. 
Um, and again, the question was, is exercise detrimental? And we're using uh, Charles's HSA long repeat uh, model. And just to make sure we're all on the same page with that, um, that model uh, uh, contains a transgene that is uh, the human skeletal alpha actin gene in its totality. And, and it is inserted 250, 230, 250 CTG repeats. Uh, it very nicely reproduces uh, uh, the effects in, seen in myotonic dystrophy. It is skeletal muscle specific because it is a skeletal muscle specific uh, gene and promoter. Uh, it forms those nuclear RNA foci with muscle blind co-localization and sequestration. I should have put that there. Um, and it also has DM uh, rel uh, relevant splicing changes uh, that are the cause of myotonia. So it's that muscle specific uh, uh, chloride channel splicing that causes the myotonia. There's also some milder histological changes. And I think it's also important to point out uh, that uh, when this was published, it also included a control animal that had the same transgene with only five repeats that did not show uh, any of those uh, uh, phenotypes. I think I'll also point out uh, to the, the trainees in the, in the audience that 2000, that, that really wasn't that long ago. <laughs> All right, so here's what we did. Uh, we, have, um, uh, we had two groups of mice, uh, the wild type mice and the HSA repeat mice. We broke them up into exercising and sedentary, uh, five and five for the wild types, uh, six uh, for exercise for the, uh, the DM mouse, and uh, five sedentary. And this was a 10-week um, a progressive endurance exercise training uh, program. So this was on a treadmill. So they were on a treadmill uh, for 10 weeks. Uh, they were exercised for five days a week. Uh, we increased, uh, I should say, Lydia increased the speed uh, weekly, as you can see here, which is indicated here, and that they ran for an hour. And so this is the total distance that they ran. So you'll see assays uh, at uh, the starting point, uh, the prospective assays at the starting point, at five weeks and at 10 points, uh, 10 weeks. And then we also harvested the tissues and did molecular analysis uh, at the end of 10 weeks. To answer the first question was, is there muscle damage? These aren't great histological uh, slides. We have found a better supplier uh, since then. Uh, but the bottom line was that we did not see any overt muscle damage in uh, the animals that underwent exercise, the DM a model that went under exercise. All right, first thing we looked at was the level of expression of the transgene with those uh, 250 repeats. And so uh, this was done by RT-PCR using primers that are located in exons six uh, and seven, and it gives this band up here. Uh, internal control is the mouse gap DH gene, uh, uh, mRNA, which gives this band uh, here. Uh, we also do it with a uh, minus reverse transcriptase uh, to make sure that any band we're picking up is not just picking up the genomic DNA. So we are picking up only the RNA. And as you can see, the transgene is not expressed in a wild type as expressed. Um, and the bottom line of this result was we found that exercised animals, uh, uh, DM animals, there's a sedentary, here's exercised, had a lower level of expression of the transgene. So it reduced the toxic level of the repeat RNA, which was an unexpected result. But it's a transgene driven by the actin promoter. The concern was, well, maybe exercise just changes actin expression. Uh, maybe it's nothing to do with the repeats. It's more that the transgene is uh, the promoters being affected or actin stability, mRNA stability is being affected. But that turned out not to be the case. We looked at the endogenous mouse um, uh, uh, that, that's wrong, sorry. This is the mouse uh, gene. Uh, and we found that there was no change in the uh, expression of actin. So it appeared that the reduction of the toxic RNA was due to the presence of those CUG repeats. So then we started looking at some of those characteristic splicing uh, events. And so let me uh, go through what that assay, is, how that assay is done. Um, and so we use primers that are in the flanking exons uh, and in the mRNA they will pick up the RNA that includes the exon and give a larger PCR product uh, than the mRNAs that skip that exon. And so you'll see two bands in each lane that are um, uh, a ratio of the band that uh, representing mRNAs that include the exon or skip the exon. 
And so this is um, uh, the PSI, the percent spliced in is the way we characterize this. And basically that's taken the signal in the top band uh, divided by the signal in the top band divided uh, plus the signal in the, in the bottom band. And it gives you a sense that all the mRNAs that are expressed from this gene, 5% of those mRNAs include the exon, 63% include the exon in this sample. And so we looked at uh, that gene that I showed you, the RNA seq for, which is the circle one gene. And I think even by, uh, well, let's point out this first. So you can see that as I showed by RNA seq in the wild type animals, a hundred percent of the exon is included. This is the band for when the exon is skipped. And you can see in this, uh, I think you can actually see by eye, you get used to looking at the ratio of these bands. So let's go over here for the sedentary, uh, you can see the band the bottom band, skipping band, looks a little darker than the top band, but it's the reversed in, uh, in the exercise. So there was a change of splicing uh, for this gene. And that is quantitated on the next slide. So this, these are the exercised animals uh, in the light gray. And then, uh, 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 then uh, so sedentary, uh, I'm sorry, I got the way around. The, the uh, sedentary and then the exercised going more towards uh, the normal splicing pattern. And that's the same for these other splicing events we looked at um, that are affected in myotonic dystrophy. And many of the events we looked at that are not affected were not affected in, uh, by exercise. So this was not like a global change of alternative splicing. It appeared to be the ones that are affected specifically uh, in myotonic dystrophy. Some other assays was, we actually started finding some differences between uh, the HSA, uh, the DM mice and the wild type mice. And one of those, was the increase in muscle weights. So here's the one in particular. So this is the quadriceps. Um, we found that the um, from the sedentary to the exercise mice, we saw an increase in the muscle, which we did not see uh, in the wild type mice. And we saw a hint of a trend for the EDL muscle and the TA muscle as well. Um, you can imagine that perhaps it was that the baseline uh, muscle weight uh, for the DM mouse is lower than wild type. And perhaps what we're doing is coming up uh, to what the normal level is, the weight of the muscle. Um, but we don't, didn't have the, the statistics to, to say that. Something else I wanted to point out was if we just followed the weight of the animals over time, uh, you can see, you know, I found this to be particularly interesting. You can see that the sedentary animals of the wild type are clearly gaining weight. Uh, whereas in the DM mice, they don't gain any more weight than the exercise. The exercise and the sedentary gain weight at the same rate. And it appears to be the reason for that is a difference in the way that the, the repeat expressing mice uh, uh, gain fat. So let's go with the, the wild type mice, uh, the sedentary compared to the exercise. You can see the sedentary mice uh, gain fat. Uh, I don't know, some of us might be familiar with this phenomena. Uh, and with the exercise, uh, they, they have less, less fat. But that is not the case with uh, the, the, the mice, that even the sedentary DM mice uh, don't accumulate fat with, to the same degree as did uh, the wild type mice. Another difference was a change in increased bone density. So there was not much a change of bone density in the wild type mice between sedentary and exercised, but in the DM mice, there by 10 weeks, there was this increased bone density. Um, and again, you can imagine that perhaps that's just coming up to a normal level matching what's in the in the wild type, in the wild type mice. I'm just suggesting that we didn't we didn't uh, calculate that statistically. And a couple other parameters, um, just to show that that both the wild type mice and the uh, DM mice had uh, increase, uh, improved endurance, uh, maximal oxidative capacity. Uh, there was not a change of grip strength. And one thing to point out is that this was a um, uh, an exercise model, a treadmill model. Perhaps a resistance strength uh, training could have a different effect. Uh, not not something that we've done. All right, the last uh, data slide I'll show you is, uh, we looked at the expression of muscle blind. There's a change of splicing. Is there a change in muscle blind uh, one or muscle blind two expression? And the bottom line is in the DM mice, there was not a change in the expression of muscle blind one 
or muscle blind two. We did find a, a decreased expression of muscle blind two in the wild type mice. Um, how significant that might be biologically is hard to gauge. Muscle blind two is the lesser expressed uh, isoform in muscle. So this may not have been much, this may not be much of a, a biologic, have biological effect. And in particular, you saw that uh, the circle one splicing event, which is very sensitive to a decreased expression of muscle blind, that didn't change in these mice. So we think it probably didn't have much of an effect. All right. So in summary, our uh, conclusions, uh, the exercise did not uh, damage these mice. In fact, it was beneficial. Uh, the CUG repeat levels were reduced uh, significantly, and that is most likely uh, the cause of the shift of the splicing towards more normal. Didn't completely correct splicing uh, because there is repeat RNA that's still there, but it did start that shift. It probably did free up more of muscle blind one, didn't increase the level of muscle blind one, but the muscle blind one that was there was no longer sequestered. It was free uh, to regulate its splicing events. But I thought what was what's particularly interesting um, is uh, the metabolic differences that seem to be associated with uh, the HSR mice, and particularly uh, that the uh, sedentary HSA long repeat mice do not have a weight gain because they did not accumulate body fat as much as the sedentary animals. So there's something uh, different about those animals. Um, and then the increase in bone density, the increase in muscle weight for a few muscles might have been just coming back up to uh, normal levels, uh, um, uh, matching what's in the wild type animals, which again is a very a very positive result. And I did point out that the results are limited to endurance exercise. It would be interesting to see what happened with uh, resistance exercise. All right, so I pointed out the two people who did the work, but I did want to show uh, the lab and also wanted to point out that we have three people from the lab that are here and will be presenting posters please uh, mingle and find out what they're doing. They're each doing very different and interesting things. Uh, Sarah, Larissa, and Rong Chi are here. And uh, thank you uh, for your attention. One more thing, because I wanna thank the funders of our work, <laughs> and particularly Myotonic Dystrophy and WIC and MDA and NIH, even though they're not here. Oh, thanks. So let's try to do questions into microphones if we can. You want to... Dr. Ashizawa has got one. Thank you, Tom. That was a wonderful talk. It's a very, very exciting, interesting, and uh, going along with some of the clinical studies. But my question is a mechanistic one. So <laughs> what changes the splicing by exercise? And second, secondly, there are some parallel with the senescence and myotin dystrophy process. There are a whole lot of literature with exercise uh, in senescence. How do you compare those? To oh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, I, I think that, I, and I think we'll hear more about the molecular, uh, the molecular effects of, of uh, um, exercise and how, I think that's a very interesting question. How can we relate that to senescence and would uh, senescence markers, would sen the effects of senescence, is that being re reversed uh, by myotonic dystrophy? I think it's a, it's a very interesting question and I'm not going to answer it right now. Hi, uh, great talk. Thank you very much. I, I'm just curious. The um, gastroc, I think, is a fast twitch muscle primarily, and the soleus is a slow twitch. I'm just wondering if you did any histochemistry and looked at any differences um, in these, and whether there was any impact of training on that. Right, and and uh, and actually, we we did not. I mean, the most that we did uh, was, uh, to measure weights of the different muscles. Uh, we, and all the molecular analysis were done on the gas truck, but yes, I think that's also a very, a, a very interesting point to compare, uh, those two effects. Nice talk. Um, so did you check a uh, food intake in those HSALR mice where you don't see the, uh, weight gain? I'm sorry, say it again. Did you check the food intake? In those HSA LR mice, we did not gain the weight. 
uh, the force index. No, food index. Food index. Yeah. Uh, no, no, um, no, we did not. We did, we did talk about that um, and we did not, um, we did not put them into that, into that essay. I actually have the same question that already asked. Uh -huh. Okay. Hey, excellent talk. Uh, I just wanted to know, like, uh, do you have any proposed mechanism how this exercise reduces uh, toxic RNA loads? Yeah, that's a great question. And and uh, no, no, we didn't. We didn't go there. So, um, yeah, I would since we did not see that there was a change in the level of the. Um, uh, I guess where I'm going is I don't think it was the promoter. I don't know that the exercise would have affected the promoter of the transgene. I think it probably had more to do with uh, disrupting the foci, uh, having a higher level of turnover of the repeat RNA, which is interesting when you think of it, because the repeat RNA is continuously being expressed. So that means it needs to continuously be uh, turned over at a faster rate uh, as well. So you know, it'd be interesting to look at the um, uh, exonucleases and, and the processes that degrade uh, RNA. And since the RNA is in the nucleus, it would also be interesting to know whether the RNA uh, transitioned from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Is it degraded in the nucleus uh, where it's stuck or does it break up? Does it get transported into the cytoplasm? And is that where it's degraded? So I think there's a lot of very interesting questions there. Hi, two questions. Um, so kind of going off the mechanism one, do you guys look at nuclear foci in these tissues to see if you're reducing the number of foci or the foci size? No, uh, we did not. Um, uh, and that would kind of address the thing we were just talking about. I think we also felt like with the, 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 the effect that we saw was relatively small. And we thought we didn't have a quantitative enough assay to be able to tell whether those foci were, were different. And then second question, um, do you think you'll be able to see benefit in any other affected tissues like the heart with this exercise? Right. Yeah. Another good question. Um, and um, that will be interesting to see. Um, the um, Yeah. And again, I did point out that this was skeletal muscle specific. Which is interesting that the metabolism differences that we see is limited to skeletal muscle. So I think that's a very nice aspect of that model, but it'll be interesting to see what would happen in a model that expresses repeats in the heart. Hi, Dr. Cooper. That I actually have a follow-up question about sure. that. More metho methodological. Um, and so having done exercise mice, it gives me a little bit of PTSD about it. Uh, but <laughs> I, I realized that- That explains the a lot. <laughs> The um, intensity that you increase with your mice were um, primarily aerobic. Um, and so the, the decrease, uh, the increase in weight with increased muscle mass is somewhat expected, but I saw that you did oxygen uptake um, and we really expect from the intervention itself, maybe um, improvement in cardiorespiratory skeletal, you know, musculoskeletal um, interaction. Um, I'm just curious, how did you measure oxygen uptake in the, um, the mice in your study? Uh, let's talk later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I asked that because I I actually my first one I attempted that I I um, we'll probably have to talk about that later. I admit to killing a mice. I, mean, I know it was it was a chamber, so they did the exercise to exhaustion. Okay, uh, in a chamber, um, and uh, we we could talk later too. <laughs> okay, I think it, I think it may be easier to do it in humans than to exercise mice to exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mice. Yeah, you have to have a shock pad for them to keep running. So. I, All right. I had, I had one one more quickie. Sure. Um, so the the uh, the animals run long distances. Yes. And I don't actually know how long it takes them to run six or eight kilometers a night, but I imagine it's several hours. So it's it's a fairly long duration of of uh, exercise every day. Um, and so I, I thinking about what that would do is there what do we know in skeletal muscle? I would imagine that this would be like carrying out biochemistry in a cement mixer while it's turned on versus when it's turned off. And that <laughs> the impact of that on lots of molecular interactions might be rather profound. But do we know anything about that in, in skeletal muscle? <laughs> I think I probably know more about what happens in a cement mixer than the... Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. 
good starting point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. All right. we, we have a question from a virtual attendee. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, does the data on the involvement of mitochondrial ETC complex one and four dysfunction integrate with or complement these data on phenotype or functional improvement from exercise? I think I heard, yeah, my hearing isn't so good. I think I heard most of that. Um, I can try again. Does the data on the involvement of mitochondrial EPC oh, yeah, complex yeah. one and four dysfunction integrate with or complement these data on phenotype functional improvement from exercise? No, that's a nice, that's a nice question as well. It's something that, that we did not, did not assay, um, but would certainly be uh, something to look at. You know, and, and even just examining the mitochondria to see if there's a change in what the mitochondria look like, do EM studies, electron microscopy studies, that would that would be very interesting. Thanks. All Sean. right, thank you. Go ahead. So just, um, I'm, I'm thinking that um, there's a lot of pent up demand for questions and discussions that hasn't been met for a few years. And so, so I just want to to um, mention to the upcoming speakers to try and calibrate their um, presentations to allow for that because I think people really want it now and need it. Um, and and unfortunately, we have a hard stop at eleven for this part of the session. But um, that said, um, I'm delighted that Mark Tarnopolsky has joined us today in this. Um, um, almost predominantly Canadian session that we're having here. <laughs> and, um, and we'll probably try to do that going forward as well. And, and Mark's gonna talk about uh, some human studies. Do you know how to While we're getting the slides up, I just wanted to thank Charles for inviting me and uh, to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for inviting me. It's lovely to be back here. I don't have a mask on actually uh, to give this talk. So I'm sure everyone here is all vaccinated. There we are. So I'm gonna talk about uh, exercise and nutritional interventions. Uh, perhaps I missed the uh, target audience and I do have quite a bit of clinical stuff in here too. Uh, as you may be familiar, we've done a lot of work in the area. So it's gonna be a very high level discussion about some of the stuff that we've done in the area of exercise and nutritional interventions. But you'll see how these two uh, come together. And as you heard in the last talk, uh, we know that there's an accumulation of body fat. And so nutrition uh, logically comes into play. Before we start, I'll just disclose uh, some of my um, speaker honoraria, uh, consulting, and most importantly, I'm the founder and CEO of Exerkine Corporation, where we've been looking at the molecules which mediate the systemic effects of exercise, which is quite relevant to what we were just talking about, and also uh, looking at uh, nutraceutical approaches to the treatment of mitochondrial disease, obesity, and aging. So there's a lot of topics here. Um, I'll just briefly go through uh, what we study in lab in the clinic, talk a little bit about what we've done years ago on habitual diet in DM1 patients, some of the deficiencies that we've identified in patients uh, that are amenable to treatment, uh, and again, relevant to the last talk, body composition and MD patients, and then get into the benefits of exercise, uh, benefits both uh, in the habitual uh, aspect with uh, DM1 and FSH patients, some work uh, that uh, some of you may be familiar with that we published in JCI, on an endurance study in DM1 patients. And then we'll talk about multi-ingredient supplementation uh, because we have a CIHR grant uh, that we're going to be starting the interaction between both endurance plus resistance and nested within that we'll have some targeted nutritional interventions. <clears throat> so what did we study in the lab? For many years, I've been helping out the kinesiology department, doing muscle biopsies, AB catheters, uh, and a lot of molecular work, trying to understand how uh, healthy people can do high intensity contractions, which leads to muscle hypertrophy. And we've looked at uh, uh, RNA-seq and various other uh, ways that we've uh, better understood the molecular mechanisms which underpin hypertrophy. So too, we've also been involved in understanding how sedentary people can become top sport athletes, or at least in response to endurance exercise, increase their mitochondria, their cardiorespiratory fitness. And uh, we've come to understand quite a bit about these mechanisms. But as a neurologist, I want to apply these mechanisms to our patients. 
So the main group that I've been involved in, some of you may be familiar with my work in mitochondrial disorders, and I've spent most of my uh, career looking at how we can improve the function in people who have primary mitochondrial dysfunction. But as you'll see, DM1 is a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction disorder. And what we find in muscular dystrophy and many other disorders, even common things like obesity and the sarcopenia of aging, which were briefly touched upon in the last talk, is that there is mitochondrial dysfunction, there's atrophy of skeletal muscle. So to some extent, really, uh, muscular dystrophy is the antithesis of hypertrophy because of the atrophy we see, and mitochondrial dysfunction is the antithesis of the uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and the improvement in VO2 max that we see in individuals who do endurance exercise. And we've been involved in many studies with some of these more common disorders, but my main focus is on muscular dystrophy and mitochondrial disease, and we'll talk about that. So the first thing I was going to talk about very briefly is just some nutritional inadequacies that we've discovered in patients, because I think these are simple, low-hanging fruit that can really help our patients. So we did a study a few years ago. We looked at 51 uh, patients with uh, muscular dystrophy. The majority were myotonic dystrophy type 1 patients. And we did uh, a prospective three-day food records, including a weekend and two weekdays. And we repeated it and took the average. And um, we did that five months later. And what we're reporting here are the mean values. And we compared their dietary intake to the Canadian dietary reference intake, which you may be familiar with if you're from the United States, the RDA or recommended daily allowance. And what we found is that, and uh, what I have here in white are adult and in um, uh, green here are pediatric as we had some Duchenne boys here. Uh, but when we look at energy intake, 68% of our adults were not meeting even the basal requirements for being a sedentary individual. And as a consequence of that, you're gonna pull down, if you will, many of the other um, uh, vitamins and minerals. So you can look across a variety of uh, water soluble, fat soluble, common things like vitamin D deficiency, vitamin E, 98% of our patients were not meeting the basic requirements for vitamin E. And why that's important is you know, vitamin E is a membrane antioxidant and we know that there's oxidative stress in myotonic dystrophy, FSH dystrophy, and uh, mitochondrial disease. And I won't go through all of them, but you can even see here several of the minerals. And we were talking about uh, body uh, composition and bone mineral density. You can see that 72% of our patients were not meeting the requirements uh, for a basic calcium intake. Um, what's interesting too is protein uh, requirements here. And these are for sedentary individuals. Uh, work out of the University of Rochester, Birch Briggs and others have done work looking at protein synthesis in patients with muscular dystrophy, showing that it's low. And we and others in aging have also shown that you need a higher protein intake to support uh, aging associated muscle protein synthesis. So this is a vast underestimation of the protein inadequacy for many of our patients. So if we look specifically at our DM1 patients, as I mentioned, that represented the ma uh, majority. And uh, I won't highlight the uh, specific nutrients, but I wanted to highlight body composition. So you can see the BMI greater than 30, which indicates being overweight or obese. It looks not bad, only 10% were. If you look at those that were underweight, 13%. So it appears from our analysis that most patients have a normal body composition. Hold that thought in just a minute. So what we've done is we did a, what's called a DEXA scan on a variety of our patients. And uh, you may be familiar with our JCI paper where we had 11 patients with myotonic dystrophy, where we did DEXA scans before and after exercise. And we were probably not that surprised because we've seen across a variety of disorders from myotonic dystrophy type one, mitochondrial disease, Pompe disease, Becker's Duchenne and FSH, this clustering. And what you see is 30 here is the BMI, which indicates being overweight. And as you get through different categories of obesity, we won't get into that, but you can see that there's not that many patients that appear to be overweight. Um, by the same token, there are some patients that appear to be underweight um, by BMI, which is less than 15 here. But what I pointed out here is that the, you cannot get body fat unless you do a DEXA scan or some other measurement. So just from height and weight, you can't determine what the body fat is. And if body fat correlated perfectly with um, the body mass index, we would see a straight linear line, but we don't. You see this sagging down here. And what this sagging represents in uh, the uh, purple are the proportion of patients who had a normal BMI, but were obese by DEXA scan. So what's happening in our patients is you're hiding the amount of body fat that they have. And what we found too, is most of it tends to be the abdominal body fat, which is what's metabolically most disadvantageous and increases the risk for fatty liver disease and uh, dysglycemia. 
So what does this all mean from a practical perspective? And you'll probably laugh. Uh, this is even older than the last slide uh, uh, where the study was done in 2000, or the mice were created in 2000. Uh, but we had an old system, which was much easier for us to obtain data from. We have a new EPIC system. We hopefully we'll be able to get this now. But we look back in our old system, in our patients that we had in the clinic from 1996 to 2001. And yes, it's still in preparation because we had a, a, a postdoctoral fellow who went back and just looked at this recently. So we had uh, almost almost 1,900 patients, equal numbers of men and women. And we had a blood test where at least one vitamin was uh, sent, RBC folate, B12, vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E. And so if in fact people are not eating enough and not getting enough vitamins and minerals, does it practically mean that they become deficient? And I apologize for the quality of the slide, the colors didn't come out nicely, but uh, these are the proportion of patients. So that means nobody's deficient. And this means 20% of the patients are deficient. Bottom line is anywhere from about six to 12% of our patients were deficient for folate, B12, vitamin A, vitamin D and vitamin E. So this is measured at the blood level, which we would predict from the fact that they weren't getting enough uh, in their diet were deficient. One point I wanted to really highlight in Northern uh, states and also in Canada is the greater proportion of individuals with vitamin D insufficiency. And now we know that vitamin D levels for deficiency at this point in time were to prevent rickets. So even here, uh, about 10% of our patients were in the rickets range for vitamin D. And we also know that there's something that a lot of us forget about called rickettic myopathy. And that is that severely low vitamin D levels uh, lead to a myopathy with high CK and muscle weakness. Not a good state to be in if you're already weak. However, we now know that for optimal health for vitamin D, the new guidelines uh, in Canada are 80 nanomoles per liter, which would render 85% of our patients not getting adequate amounts of vitamin D. So I'll just briefly to go through some very practical uh, things that we've discovered over the years in myotonic dystrophy patients, but we also see this in sporadic IBM uh, and in CPEO, a mitochondrial disease, where uh, dysphagia is quite common. So when we think about the habitual diet, what are some of our general suggestions? Well, we know that energy intake is low, and that's because most people don't move very much. The average American gets 4,000 steps. The average patient that we have gets generally under 2,000 if they're still ambulatory. So if you're not moving much, you don't burn very much, you don't eat very much, and uh, therefore you have low expenditure. The other thing that we notice is that food preparation, eating and swallowing can be a challenge for many patients, and therefore they're just not uh, consuming as much. Dysphagia, as I mentioned, is a big issue. The other important uh, sort of socioeconomic uh, perspective is that most foods that are cheap are crap. Uh, they're highly processed, they're high in fat, they're high in simple sugars, not good uh, from a metabolic perspective at all. So what are our suggestions over the years? What we found is that a number of our patients, even if they're not reporting a swallowing issue, if you ask their spouse, they often are choking after dinner, uh, they're having a difficult time with particulate foods, et cetera. So uh, we recommend a video fluoroscopy swallowing study if there's any signs of dysphagia, and we ask the patient and their spouse or partner or some other caregiver, uh, because often they're the ones who can uh, pick this up. We also suggest to take a balanced multivitamin because if you ain't pulling in the calories, especially if you have uh, poor nutrient uh, uh, heavy foods, uh, a balanced multivitamin is prudent. And for patients who can't swallow the large multivitamins, there are a number that are liquid. We also check for deficiencies. It's low hanging fruit. A lot of neurologists say, well, that's not real medicine, but give me a break. Vitamin B12 deficiency can cause uh, neuropathy. It can cause myelopathy and vitamin D insufficiency can cause a myopathy. So it makes sense to check and uh, treat what you can. The other important point is often when a patient has a deterioration in function, we think it's progression of their disease, but we've had innumerable examples. I don't even have time to start getting into them, but one was Friedrich's ataxia patient. who had non-detectable vitamin E, which uh, can definitely exacerbate uh, ataxia and peripheral neuropathy. So a deterioration in function may indicate an underlying deficiency and it's low hanging fruit to treat. In patients, especially uh, children who are falling off the growth curve, we recommend a G-tube, uh, especially if there's issues with swallowing uh, and not getting adequate uh, nutrition. So let's get into exercise. Uh, we have published many papers over the last 35 years looking at exercise training in older adults. We like older adults because older adults, uh, i.e. everyone in this room as we're aging, has a mitochondrial disease, which is aging. And so to study mitochondrial dysfunction, we like to study older adults because they don't mind as much if I do multiple biopsies, AV catheters, and really get at the molecular mechanisms. So over the years, we've learned, and they're a dime a dozen. I mean, everyone's getting older. 
Um, we know that with resistance training in both men and women, and we're one of the few groups that studies equal numbers of men and women, that there's an improvement in strength, improvement in functional capacity, increase in muscle mass, and an increase in mitochondrial capacity. And this can be done safely, uh, starting off at lower uh, reps and in, uh, intensity and gradually ramping up. At the molecular level, we see lower oxidative stress and lower inflammation. 15, 20 years ago, you know, you go to conferences and people say, oh, don't exercise, you're gonna cause more damage. Uh, exercise we know causes oxidative stress. It's horrible for muscular dystrophy because they already have oxidative stress. That's complete bollocks. What happens is that in response to exercise, we upregulate endogenous antioxidants and the basal level of oxidative stress is lower by uh, any metric that we measure. Furthermore, inflammation is down. So yes, interleukin-6 and interleukin-15 and all of these pro-inflammatory cytokines and some are anti-inflammatory, pulse with exercise and go up, but it's the basal level that eventually comes down. And it's chronic low-grade inflammation that's associated with human aging and senescence. And we also see this across pretty much every one of the disorders that we see in the clinic. So we did um, a study, <clears throat> this is uh, the one that uh, some of you may be familiar with and JCI published earlier this year. And again, I'm not gonna get down to the weeds on this, but we can certainly talk about it. Uh, but what we did is we actually tried uh, aerobic exercise in our patients with myotonic dystrophy type one. Uh, the average CTG repeat in this study was 600. Uh, so these were not just mild patients. We had some that were close to a thousand and patients that were profoundly weak. Um, I won't get into this because we know all of this. And what we looked at was 11 patients uh, with the demographics I just described and compared them to age and sex match controls. So the goal of this was to see how are they different at baseline and can we bring our patients closer to uh, able-bodied individuals following just three months of cycling, three times a week at 65% of VO2 peak for 35 minutes. That was about the average at the end. Now, we had one lady who was so profoundly weak when she came in, she lasted 35 seconds on the bike with zero watts, so she could just barely spin and she was just toast. But we gradually got people into it and even she could finish this by the time we were done. So it's incredible how someone with profound uh, exercise intolerance, and we see the same with mitochondrial disease as well, uh, you know, same scenario where people can eventually adapt. Uh, and why that's important is if someone can only last 35 seconds spinning on zero watts. Think about their daily activities. It's representing close to 100% of their VO2 max or their strength output, and it's very taxing. So if we can raise the ceiling, their daily activities are done at a lower proportion of their maximal capacity, and hence uh, daily activities seem to be easier. <clears throat> so again, we, we saw a whole bunch of stuff that I won't get into if we wanna talk about this later. What we didn't see is we didn't see a correction of the splicing defects. There was a very slight trend towards a slight reduction in the uh, CUG uh, um, inclusions uh, and muscle blind one bound to uh, inclusions went down slightly, but it wasn't significant. But what we did see is a huge restoration of mitochondrial dysfunction. So um, people have talked about this before, but I think we're the first to show, and we uh, did RNA-seq and showed at the transcriptional level, that one of the biggest differences between patients and controls obviously was RNA splicing. That was our number one hit, but number two, was uh, oxidative metabolism and mitochondrial dysfunction. So we're a mitochondrial lab, so obviously we dug into this. And what you can see here, this is just a, a Western blot looking at the various complexes in mitochondria, comparing controls to myotonic dystrophy patients before training. And you can see the huge differences uh, and then after. And if you quantify this, what you can see here, and it, the, uh, it's the same, doesn't matter if you go from complex uh, one to complex five subunits, you can see a reduction in patients and restoration with exercise. So what it shows, again, confirming that there's mitochondrial dysfunction in patients, and it's not just complex one and complex four, which we heard from the question, it's across all of the complexes. Um, and it doesn't matter if we look at mitochondrial encoded subunits or nuclear encoded subunits, it is the same. At a functional level, we also uh, took out uh, muscle fibers, uh, we skinned the fibers, and we did respiration on individual fibers. Uh, so this is essentially that the respiratory uh, chain is intact as opposed to uh, maximal protein. And uh, what we did here on the Ouroboros is show and confirm that at the functional level, there is a reduction and that is reversed with exercise training. And then at the histological level, you can see that there's this dysfunction on this SDH stain uh, and uh, complete rest, or not complete, almost complete restoration. The other interesting point was that some people thought that you would cause damage to muscle. So we had a trained uh, neuropathologist who scored blindly all of our muscle samples. And what we found was a slight trend, I think it was 0.051, my favorite p-value, uh, <laughs> towards 
uh, a reduction in internalized nuclei, and there was actually a slight reduction in the amount of uh, fibrosis that occurred, which fits with our RNA-seq data that the only real things that changed significantly uh, at the transcriptional level was uh, fibrosis uh, and extracellular matrix remodeling uh, improved. So uh, if anything, muscles look better, not worse. So uh, we've shown that it was safe. I mentioned the histopathology. We showed no increase in CK. At the cardiac level uh, as well, we know that there's benefits in older adults when they do endurance exercise training in terms of ejection fraction. We didn't do echoes because very few of our patients with this type of muscle disease, DM1, have dysfunctional uh, ejection fractions. The big problem, of course, is conduction block. Now, there was a very slight increase in the PR interval, which was not clinically significant. Nobody changed uh, from being normal into a, a more advanced uh, first degree block. And that is a normal phenomenon with exercise training. So we didn't think that was pathologic. You see that across every training study that the PR interval goes up a little bit, uh, but we didn't see any other issues from a, a conduction block perspective. Importantly, function went up. So six minute walk test went up 47 meters. And uh, for some of you who are familiar with um, myozyme for patients with Pompe disease, the LOTS trial showed a 27 meter increase and uh, our governments pay 1 million bucks per person per year for myozyme. And you can see here how much more effective exercise is. And that's actually been shown in Pompe patients as well to see almost double the benefits from exercise that you see from uh, enzyme replacement therapy. And I've actually given talks to Gen for Genzyme and Amicus. So, you know, I'm, uh, maybe they're never gonna ask me back again to give a talk. <laughs> Importantly, though, we also found that timed up and go and five times sit to stand increase quite dramatically, almost back to normal levels. Uh, so there's functional correlates to this. Uh, as uh, we were talking about earlier, uh, VO2 peak, uh, it's quite easy to measure this in humans and it's easy to measure it in mice. We won't get into that, uh, but it went up 31%. Uh, we also saw an increase in uh, fat free mass, a 1.6 kilo increase in fat free mass. What's interesting is we didn't see an increase in strength. So neither grip nor knee extension strength went up. But we see that across the board when we take older adults and we train them with endurance training, their aerobic capacity goes up, but their strength doesn't, which gets into my final slide and our next study. What we did find though, is that with fat-free mass going up and body fat going down a little bit, what I've coined uh, just recently in a paper is called the body composition index. Instead of the body mass index, which is just this useless relationship between your height and weight, which is good for populations, but not good for individual studies. What this refers to, and I've coined this as the ratio of fat-free mass in kilos uh, based on DEXA over fat mass in kilograms. Colloquially, uh, we call it the ripped ratio. So for the young people, they wanna get ripped. Um, and that's really what it refers to is you have less body fat, more muscle mass. And that actually went up uh, significantly. So one of the things uh, that we wondered about exercise, and uh, this was some data with FSH dystrophy, and we've uh, done the same too with, uh, with other disorders. And that is that uh, there is a decline, as we know, with healthy human aging. This is your knee extension strength in Newton meters uh, measured by our biodex. And with healthy older individuals going from age 65 to age 85, there's a slow decline in strength. For most people, you're above a disability threshold, no big deal. But for many of our patients, and I've just stylistically put in uh, some patient uh, data here, uh, obviously with FSH dystrophy, your uh, strength is down. And what happens is that depending on the severity of the disease, and if you're sedentary, as you decline, uh, where it becomes a problem is you cross disability thresholds. We have data from 10,000 patients with muscle disease over the last 26 years with the biodex. And what we find is when we get to 30 Newton meters, 50% of our people need a cane. When we get down to 20 Newton meters, 50% need a walker. When we get to 10, 50% need a wheelchair. So what we're trying to do is to keep people above that disability threshold. So either starting from a higher level, even if you decline at the same rate, uh, you're going to uh, get there later and you're going to cross that disability threshold later. Or if you can shift the slope of the curve through exercise, can we push that out? Think about Duchenne dystrophy, about a 6% benefit from taking corticosteroids, but you push out the time to wheelchair by about 1.5 years. So tiny changes in that rate or bumps up uh, at any given point in time can change their trajectory. So we did a study and this was uh, published uh, years ago. Uh, Lauren Brady, who's uh, our genetic counselor now, did a master's with me. And we looked at our patients with myotonic dystrophy and we looked at uh, control uh, healthy individuals, um, uh, patients uh, with myotonic dystrophy who exercise, those who started and those who stopped. Oh, I apologize. This was, uh, we didn't have control healthy. These were sedentary myotonic patients versus those that exercised. So what we found was that the patients who exercised, uh, no surprise, had uh, greater strength uh, pretty much across the board. Uh, if we looked at knee extension, arm flexion, and uh, of course, grip, which is so important to myotonic dystrophy patients, that's the first muscle that we see uh, go down. Uh, so if you exercise, you're at a higher level. 
And if you start exercising, uh, so these are patients that over the uh, antecedent year started exercising, we saw a stat significant increase in knee extension, uh, nothing in arm flexion, nothing in grip. But these folks, again, were using leg-based activity. So this is why, as you'll see, we're wanting to now do more upper uh, body activity. Uh, but those who stopped also had a trend towards going down in their knee extension. And knee extension is so important because it's really your main determinant of those disability thresholds. And that's why we're really uh, interested in this. We have another paper coming out, the uh, effects of COVID-19 on our patients. And what we found is that in about 50 of our patients who stopped uh, or decreased exercise with COVID, there was a significant decline in their knee extension strength and their arm flexion strength. Those who maintained um, their exercise maintained their strength over the uh, two, and two years of COVID. And uh, this is just a, a data too that we're uh, working on. This is FSH muscular dystrophy and the effects of habitual exercise. So I won't get much into this, but of course, uh, FSH dystrophy is hypomethylation, uh, which leads to DUX4 toxic overexpression, which ultimately at the cellular level is just like aging, just like Duchenne dystrophy, just like myotonic oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. But we looked at um, a number of patients, 10 who were exercisers, nine who were sedentary, and I tasked my uh, research coordinator to go back and find patients that we've been following for more than 10 years. And if you look at the rate of change of the knee extension in the first 10 people we could find who exercised more than 10 years, uh, there was almost no change over that 10 year period, whereas there was a 34% uh, percent drop in those uh, who weren't exercising. And the same was true of arm flexion. And for FSH, as you know, arm flexion biceps are often affected. And it's also important from activity of daily living perspective to look at arm flexion, showing the robustness, if you will, of regular exercise. So when we look at uh, our strategy, it's to target the final common pathways in muscular dystrophy and aging. And uh, we put forth this hypothesis in Annals of Neurology years and years ago, that with exercise and nutraceutical interventions, we may be able to impact these disorders. And if we look across uh, the things that we see in the clinic, mostly FSH, IBM, and myotonic, uh, very similar to human aging. And that is that these are final common pathways, which we feel are targetable through various nutritional strategies, drugs, and exercise. And at the cellular level, what we find is with mitochondrial dysfunction, there's oxidative stress, reductions in protein synthesis, inflammation, and satellite cell dysfunction. And I won't get into it, but this uh, clearly shows that we, I believe that the mitochondria are at the heart of this, and I won't go through the pathways, but they can be linked to pretty much all of these pathophysiologic mechanisms, which we see in aging, and we also see in our uh, patients with disease. So we've, uh, and I'll finish with what we're proposing to do, and we're starting this in January. We have a grant to look at this. And so in myotonic dystrophy patients, one, we wanna add in the resistance component, but number two, we wanna see if we can target some nutraceuticals. So we've published many studies over the years looking at the benefits of high quality protein, especially milk, uh, mother nature chose properly, and we'll get into the reasons why. Uh, creatine monohydrate, uh, Cochrane Review has shown that that's helpful for um, patients with mus uh, muscular dystrophy. Calcium, vitamin D, we've talked about some of the reasons behind that. Uh, Omega-3 fish oil is interesting. Uh, I was sort of, eh, you know, I'm not sure it does very much, uh, but um, Dr. Stu Phillips uh, published this uh, nice paper uh, showing that when you immobilize people's leg and uh, if they're taking omega-3s, there is less mitochondrial dysfunction and less drop in strength. Uh, antioxidants for reasons we just dis uh, discussed. We've worked on improving mitochondrial function in mitochondrial patients. And uh, given that we found that most of our patients had sarcopenic obesity, uh, a weight loss agent, but we don't want muscle loss. And the problem is if you do bariatric surgery or you do take a GLP-1 receptor agonist, which everyone probably saw last night on American television, oh, 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 Ozempic, you know? Yeah, you all know what I'm talking about, right? So I can't believe you guys can get away with all this kind of crazy advertising of drugs. But anyhow, and the other thing is to imply, because you know that song, it's oh, 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 it's magic, right? So it's magic that this drug is going to work. Oh, I can't even believe that gets it. The FDA should pull it off the market. Anyhow, so... The issue is how do we lose weight, uh, body fat, without losing muscle mass? So one of the things that we've come up with aging is uh, called Muscle 5, which contains the five ingredients here that were selected for a reason. Stu Phillips, uh, who was one of my first postdocs, uh, came up with the combination, published a paper in PLOS One. Uh, our company bought the patent, and then we made it more commercially palatable because they, for various reasons I won't get into, and we published a paper on that. But we've also shown, too, that it lowered triglyceride levels, improved cognition, um, and also, uh, we got a paper coming out showing that it improved bone health as well. Uh, and we've done innumerable studies also looking at osteoblasts and culture with creatine. Um, so I won't get too much into that. Um, we've also been looking at ways to lower body fat without lowering muscle mass. 
Uh, so we did some studies in the high fat fed mouse model uh, where we looked at a multi-ingredient supplement which contained green tea extract, green coffee extract and four scolin which comes from mint and a mitochondrial enhancer for reasons that we described before. And what we found, and this was given to an independent researcher who uh, replicated our data. This is Rick Austin showing that the high fat fed mice have increase in body fat, uh, but with that uh, seven ingredient supplement, uh, they completely reduce the body fat in the animals. But more importantly, and where we're going with this too in humans is it reverse fatty liver. Um, so what you can see here is uh, these are the high fat fed mice. That's a fatty liver uh, stain with oil red O. And then uh, what we used to call the metabolic enhancer, we call trim seven because it has seven ingredients, almost completely reversed it, very similar to exercise. So exercise, we and others have published a very potent strategy to reduce fatty liver disease. And you can see here that uh, this supplement did something very similar, but importantly, it completely preserved muscle mass. There was no loss of muscle mass. And we've actually gone on, this is in review right now, uh, we had 60 overweight uh, men and women, uh, three months of supplementation. The primary endpoint was weight loss, but we were interested in this body composition index. And you can see here, this is weight loss on the supplement versus placebo. And here there was no loss of uh, fat-free mass. It was only body fat. So what we wanna do, uh, and this is uh, see our, our Canadian Institute for Health Research grant starting January of this year. Uh, we're just in the planning phases and getting all the regulatory approvals. We're gonna do Endurex. That's what we call endurance and resistance exercise. Uh, we have a series of videos and uh, things that we've specifically designed for resistance exercise in myotonic type one. We have that for each one of our major groups, IBM, FSH, and myotonic. And then we're gonna do our endurance program. Uh, and then we have a special uh, supplement that we've designed specifically for myotonic dystrophy patients and FSH patients, uh, and then the uh, weight loss uh, supplement, which is uh, similar to what we've just described here uh, to try and improve mitochondrial function, increase protein synthesis, and we have lots of data too in vitro and myoblast showing improvements in satellite cell function. So with that, I'll finish. These are all of the, the folks that did the work in the lab, international uh, collaborators, local collaborators, and all of our funding sources. Thanks. We've got time for a couple of quick questions. Hello, um, my name is Ben Kidd. So what we see with a lot of aging and other, when other people do exercise research in humans, we see a lot of help with sleeping and other neurological side effects like memory and all that. Did you look at any like endurance exercise, how that affected DM patients with their sleep or with any sort of cognitive function? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. We do believe that this is uh, is critical and it will change. Uh, so right now I'm uh, beta testing an URA ring here, which uh, measures your sleep. And I've got other metrics here and we're working with a company called Lumio uh, in, in Canada. They're using AI uh, and using these uh, metrics to look at sleep and other markers. The reason why it likely has a, a, an important uh, role is that we know that the clock genes, as you know, are related to mitochondria. And so mitochondrial dysfunction screws up clock genes, which can uh, then alter your stage three and stage four sleep. So by improving mitochondrial function, I think we're going to improve clock gene expression and it's probably going to be a benefit. Anecdotally, people say that it's beneficial practically don't exercise in the evening because uh, usually that does screw up your sleep. So exercising in the morning, which is when we usually do our studies uh, tends to work, but yeah, we're really excited about this and our, our partnership with Lumio to try and study this. Yeah. Sure. That was really neat. Um, sorry, not Karen, Jacinda. Um, <laughs> I didn't see um, uh, with your mitochondrial work, um, for this upcoming study, are you tracking oxidative stress biomarkers? And if so, which ones? Yeah, so we've done this uh, multiple times in a variety of different diseases, as you may be familiar with our publications in both patients and with aging. Um, the, the ones that we do in muscle uh, are usually uh, malondialdehyde. Uh, we look at the expression of manganese sod, copper zinc superoxide dismutase, because we want to look at the ratio between cytosol and, uh, and mitochondrial antioxidant defense systems uh, and oxidized to reduce glutathione ratios. Uh, the other one that we like, especially in humans, is to collect a 24-hour urine sample, and you look at the ratio of adosoprostanes to creatinine or 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine to creatinine so that you can look at DNA damage and also lipid damage. So uh, 
you showed us very nicely the exercise was really great at maintaining uh, strength, but it was really hard to actually improve strength with, with exercise alone. I was just wondering what your view was if we were to un- correct the underlying molecular defect in DM1, whether there is real capacity to increase strength and reverse symptoms. Yeah, you, you, you can increase, well, we could certainly reverse symptoms. I mean, get up and go time, stair climbs, you know, all of these things improve sure. significantly. Um, but uh, in terms of increasing strength, we, we need to add in some resistance exercise. And we clearly have shown in patients with, you know, limb girdle 2A, 2B, et cetera, we've had 70, 80% improvements in strength, no question. And people had started off 50% below the lower limit of normal. Um, so you can increase strength, but you just need to do more resistance training. And so uh, that's what we're going to add in. Um, but certainly from a functional capacity perspective, we did see capacity go up without quantitative knee extension strength improvements. Although in a population perspective and hundreds of patients, they do tend to track, uh, but individually, we definitely can see improvements. And of course, um, you know, uh, maintenance, uh, or attenuation of decline is, is meaningful to patients. And I think, you know, a drug outcome that could do that would be beneficial, uh, but improvement obviously would be the next level up. Yeah. Yeah. And I certainly wasn't meaning to diminish the the impact of exercise and i kind of follow i have a kind of follow-on question which is given that how impactful it is sorry charles mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, it's a good segue, yeah, yeah. Your there you go yeah. <laughs> pump iron <laughs> to, to, was how do we get this to patients you're saying it's not enough so how do we actually given that it's not a drug that you can sell how do we get patients this treatment well, I think there's a variety of things. Uh, you know, we are working on videos and we have a whole series that are coming out that uh, we had a DVD that we used to give out, but nobody uses DVDs anymore. So we're putting it all on YouTube. Uh, so uh, all of our different diseases, we have specific uh, training programs that we're delivering that might help. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. And we're going to move on now to a, uh, a presentation from Elise Duchesne um, at the University of Quebec in Chicoutimi. Um, and who's going to talk about uh, resistance exercise and myotonic dystrophy. Yeah, Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure to be here with you for the next two days. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, the organizing committee, for the invitation. My name is Elise Duchesne. I'm a physiotherapist and a researcher at the University of Quebec at Chicoutimi. Uh, today, I will present the result of some project that we did recently, um, more precisely on the strength training effect, uh, effects of um, skeletal muscle impairment in myotonic dystrophy type 1. So as you already know, uh, DM1 is the most prevalent adult onset neuromuscular disorder in Canada and worldwide. And more specifically in the region where I live and work in the region of Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, the prevalence is 60 times higher than um, in comparison to the rest of the world. Um, as you already know, DM1 is a multisystemic disease and skeletal muscle is severely impaired. And uh, regarding muscle deficiencies, there is a muscle weakness and muscle atrophy that are considered as clinical hallmark of the disease. And uh, regarding muscle weakness, and more specifically lower limb muscle weakness, it best explains physical limitations. And consequently, the M1 individual experience participation restriction due to these uh, physical limitations. So uh, from a therapeutic uh, perspective, it's very uh, uh, promising and interesting to consider uh, exercise and training in myotonic dystrophy type 1 population. Indeed, in LT population, physical training is the best intervention to improve muscle function. But many people with muscle disease were advised to avoid physical um, exertion, and consequently, evidence-based practice prescription uh, does not exist for patients with neuromuscular diseases. Uh, regarding the literature, um, there is a systematic review that were published, a Cochrane uh, review that were published in the first time in 2005. And this review uh, has been updated in 2009, 2013, and lastly, 2019, about the strength training and aerobic exercise training for muscle disease. 
And this kind of re review is very robust, but uh, only included um, uh, studies that were randomized controlled trials. So uh, specifically for DM1, the author conclude that the strength training, uh, more, more precisely um, moderate intensity strength training, do not arm people with DM1, but there is no uh, enough evidence to, uh, to state that uh, this kind of exercise offers benefits. Uh, recently, our group uh, published a scoping review. This kind of design uh, is broad enough to include all the studies that has been uh, carried out on, the, on, the, on this uh, subject. So the aim of our scoping review was to map out, map out sorry, what is known about the effects of exercise or training to reduce uh, muscle impairments in DM1. And we also conclude that there is a lack in this field of research. Okay. <laughs> so there is uh, some barriers to the development of training program in myotonic dystrophy population. Uh, first of all, there is a high variability in severity and progression of deficiencies observed uh, between sex, as well as, be, as between and within the M1 phenotypes. So uh, one can conclude that this could influence the muscle adaptive response to exercise. Secondly, uh, being a rare disease, the recruitment of large cohorts of participants is extremely difficult, particularly when muscle biopsies are included in the protocol. And thirdly, the heterogeneity observed between training protocols do not, does not allow for the establishment of training parameters to obtain an induced positive impact on muscle function. So we designed a project and the aim of this project was to evaluate the effects of a strength training program over time on limb muscle strength, lower limb muscle strength, uh, vastus lateral lift fiber size and uh, capacity function in men with DM1. So regarding the methods, um, 11 men with DM1 uh, underwent a 12 week lower limb strength training program uh, twice a week and uh, consisting of three series of six to eight repetition maximum. So if one individual is able to lift a load more than six to eight repetition, the load were, uh, was increased. So it's a progressive um, tr training program. And the individual have to, uh, to do a five lower limb training exercise, which were leg extension, leg press, hip abduction, uh, squat and um, plantar flexion. And we have to, I have to say that th this program was supervised by a physical therapist. So at each session, a physiotherapist was, uh, was there to, uh, to assist uh, the participants. Uh, regarding the timelines, um, all the outcomes were taken at baseline and at the end of the 12 week training program. And some of them were uh, also assessed in the middle of the training program, so at week six, and three months after the end of the training program, so at me at month six uh, from the beginning of the beginning of the training program, and six months after the end of the training program, so nine months after the beginning of the training program. Uh, regarding the outcome measure, we chose uh, two, uh, two outcome measure related to muscle strength. So the maximal isometric muscle strength of the knee extensor assessed with the quantitative muscle testing and the muscle strength uh, of the, the, the exercise that the individual um, did during the muscle program. So leg extension, leg press, hip abduction and squat. The one repetition uh, maximal method uh, is related to the, the load that the individuals are able to lift one. So the maximum load that they are able to lift on the specific uh, machine. We also look at functional uh, capacity with the 10 meter walker test at comfortable and uh, maximal walking speed and the 30 second uh, set to stand test. Uh, we also uh, took muscle biopsy at baseline and at the end of the training program. Uh, regarding the results related to muscle, um, more precisely, uh, they were published in uh, Neuromuscular Disorders in 2020. 
the first one is the strength evaluate, evaluated with uh, um, the one repetition uh, maximum method for the leg extension, the leg press, hip abduction, and squat. What we can see here, it's uh, the same pattern for all those exercises. So there is a significant increase at six weeks after the beginning of the training program and a significant increase after 12 weeks in comparison to baseline. More importantly, there is also a significant increase between the week six and week 12 for all the exercise. And this is very interesting because because in muscle physiology, um, the first week of training, when an individual get, uh, present gain in muscle strength, it's due to neuronal adaptation. Uh, but when these gain are more higher uh, later in the, in the training program, so between week six and week 12, uh, this is likely due to muscle hypertrophy. So these clinical results suggest that despite, despite the genetic defects, muscle hypertrophy could occur in the M1 population. We measure exactly the same thing with the quantitative muscle testing of the knee extensors muscle group. And uh, this muscle group was measured at baseline week six and week 12, and we see exactly the same thing. And what is very interesting is that we measure uh, this, uh, this muscle strength three months after the end of the training program and six months after the end of the training program. And we uh, observe that three months after the, the end of the training program, the gain were, uh, was maintained. So there is no diff statistical difference between the end of the training program and three months after the end of the training program. Uh, the effect was lost at six months after the end of the training program. Uh, regarding functional capacity, um, once again, the same pattern can be observed. So uh, for the 10 meter walking test at comfortable and maximal speed, there is an increase uh, at the end of the training program in comparison to baseline. Uh, and this, this uh, increase was maintained at three months and at six months after the end of the training program. Regarding to the number of repetition that an individual is able to, uh, to do on the 30 second, 30 second sit to stand test, uh, there is an increase at the end of the training program. And this increase is more important at six months after the training program. So this, this uh, result suggests that the individual in their, in their life, and there is no, no training at all after the, after the end of, of the training program. And we assess uh, it by a questionnaire and the individual uh, report that they didn't pursue the training program. So this suggests that they change something in, in their life that uh, lead uh, them more functional. Um, all those uh, clinical changes were reflected in the, uh, in the life of patient. So at the end of the training program, uh, individual report, self-report that they uh, fail to have stronger lower limb, seven uh, participants out, uh, out of 11 report this. Half of the cohort uh, report that they feel in better physical shape and have more energy and less fatigue. Um, regarding the analysis of muscle biopsy, we use some histological indicators uh, to, um, to see, first of all, the size of muscle fiber by uh, assessing the minimal ferret diameters and the variability coefficient, which is an indicator of abnormal variability of muscle fiber size and atrophy and hypertrophy factors, which are uh, indicator of abnormal number of atrophic and hypertrophic uh, fibers, muscle fibers. And we did, uh, we assessed those histological indicators on muscle fiber type one and muscle fiber type two. So it's a big table, but <laughs> just follow the, 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 the laser. <laughs> so um, 
we were very interested and we, we expect to see a difference in the muscle fiber size between, an, uh, between the beginning and uh, the end of the training program. Uh, as assessed by, by the minimal ferret diameter. You can see here for type one muscle fiber and type two muscle fiber. This is at baseline, and this is at the end of the training program. You can see that there is no significant changes in the muscle fiber size. So we were a bit disappointed to uh, observe that there is no muscle hypertrophy. But you know that DM1 is very uh, heterogeneous. So we have a closer look at our uh, other histological indicator, so uh, variability coefficient, atrophy factor, and hypertrophy factor. And when we look at the hypertroph uh, hypertrophy factor at baseline, we saw that there is a lot of abnormal values in our cohort in type one and type two muscle fibers. So based on, on this uh, observation, we divide our cohort into um, two groups. So uh, one group for the individual that present normal hypertrophy factor, and one group for the individual that present abnormal hypertrophy factor at baseline. And we did the same thing for type one fibers and type two fibers. And based on this uh, division, uh, we look at the full change of minimal ferret diameters from baseline and see that there is a difference that is a difference between the two groups and that this difference uh, was uh, significantly uh, different. So this suggests that an individualized um, approach to uh, analyze the result can be a, a good way to, uh, to, to look at the uh, the result in DM1 due to the large heterogeneity. We also look um, at the effect of this protocol on fatigue, daytime sleepiness, and apathy. So very recently, we published a, a paper uh, in the Journal of Neuromuscular Diseases. And um, very briefly, it's exactly the same timeline. And uh, there is a, the, the two... Uh, um, Interesting variables are here for daytime sleepiness and fatigue and habit. And what we observe is a decline in the fatigue and daytime sleepiness. Uh, and the, it's significant between the baseline and the month nine. So six months after the end of the training program. So there is a statistical difference. And for the apathy, there is also a decrease and the decrease occurs uh, between the baseline and the end of the training program, so week 12, and also between the baseline and three months after the end of the, the training program. What about women? <laughs> I present you a result uh, about, uh, of men, and the uh, idea between, uh, behind the first protocol was to limit the var variability by only including men, but I know that it's not very fair. Then <laughs> with a uh, next project, we train women. And those results are very preliminary, preliminary because uh, the training programs just finished in uh, early July. So we did exactly the same protocol with 12 women with DM1. And uh, our preliminary results uh, show that there is uh, an increase in the knee, in the strength muscle assess with the one repetition maximum method for the leg extension, leg press, hip abduction, and squat. And um, uh, we, we saw the, this difference in baseline versus uh, the end of the training program. So it's a very uh, important uh, difference. And we saw uh, for uh, three, uh, three exercise, a significant difference between the baseline and week six but we, we don't see the, this difference between the week six and uh, week 12. So we have to push further uh, our analysis for the, but the, the preliminary results uh, are, uh, are as such. Uh, and we also evaluated the strength with the quantitative muscle testing for the hip extensor and the extensors. And uh, we see a clear difference in uh, muscle strength uh, from baseline to, the, uh, to uh, week 12. So the analysis of muscle biopsy are, uh, will, will be done in the fall to uh, this fall. 
And in conclusion, um, strength training induces muscle strength and lasting functional gains in the M1. And this part is very important for us because if we want to uh, be able to imagine what kind of therapy is accessible for this population, we can say that if those gains uh, are maintained for a period of six months, for example, we can imagine that two times a week patient can train because I, I didn't present the attendance, but the attendance of our cohort was 97 person and 98 person. So the, the participants were very involved in the rehabilitation, but it's very, it's a, it's a burden, this kind of, of, of uh, intervention. So if we are able to do a block of 12 weeks of therapy, and this block lasts for six months, it's more uh, easier to, to imagine to implement this kind of intervention in clinic. Uh, the underlying mechanisms of this muscular positive response remain to be explored, and you will have uh, more uh, information uh, with uh, uh, my colleague in the next minute about this. <laughs> and uh, lastly, an individual approach seems important to better understand this positive response to exercise in DM1. So uh, I want to thank the, the funding agencies and uh, more importantly, the patients that were involved in this project. It was a very uh, great in, in involvement for them. Uh, my collaborators, my student, research professional and physician. So I will take the question after the presentation of uh, Dr. Berkler. Thank you. Yeah. So Andy, your, your comments just drive right in about analysis of this. Yeah. Yep, very good, thank okay. you. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank uh, the foundation and Charles uh, for the invitation to speak about this. And I just want to say this is a collaboration that started with Elise uh, over, I think, coffee in Sweden. So it's a, it's been a wonderful collaboration with Elise and her colleagues. Um, and I'm going to just actually not even cover this slide because Elise did such a beautiful job. The one point I want you to take away from this is that there is significant improvement, but there's a, a wide range of significant improvement. So between 10% and 150%. And, and this is uh, in collaboration with Elise and her um, colleagues, Marie Pri, and then our uh, joint postdoctoral fellow, Cecilia Laguerre. And I think I've lost someone on the slide from your last one, but We'll make sure we get there. So I'm going to just jump right into it. And so one of the things that we wanted to do that started with this collaboration is we wanted to look at, at things at the molecular level. So that's things how we think about things frequently. And so we asked the question, are things changing at the uh, transcriptomic level? And so we just started to start with the key genes that are involved in the, in the disease mechanism. So we looked at DMPK transcript. And the one thing that is sort of interesting is whenever you look at all the data combined, and that's what that all is, you see very little change, okay? But when you look at the individual level, and this is all pre and post exercise. So Elise sent us down the muscle biopsies before the exercise and then at the end of the 12 weeks, right? And so you just heard all, all of the great results from that. And so what we did was we prepared RNA-seq libraries from the pre and the post, and then we've done deep sequencing. And so this is pulled out of the deep sequencing data. And the takeaway is that the DMPK transcript is changing. And there's really two individuals where it changes fairly significantly. And just remember uh, individual 907 and individual 523, because we'll come back to those. Um, the MBNL transcripts are, there's changes, they're up and down. They're not as significant as the uh, DMPK transcripts. Um, and then I'm not showing the uh, self genes and those are fairly modest as well. So actually we thought there might not be a lot of changes, but as I'll show you, there are a lot of interesting changes. So this is just jumping right into it. Um, there's lots of things that are changing. And so again, when if you take all the uh, changes and you look pre and post in the red there on the far left in the all, you can see that there's a trend, there's a little bit of a difference, but it, initially we weren't that excited because we didn't think a lot of things were changing. Then when we sort of thought about the heterogeneity of uh, individuals with myotonic dystrophy and maybe the, uh, the response was heterogeneous, we thought, well, let's look pre and post at each individual. And so then when you take 
um, the individual uh, uh, deep sequencing data, RNA-seq data, and you look at splicing changes, and what we use is down there at the bottom, um, we're using a, a psi value of 0.2, so it has to actually change 20% to be counted as a change between pre and post exercise. And then an FDR, a false discovery rate of 0 0.05. So we're looking for things that are fairly, are, are significant. Um, for some of our other studies, we've used 0.1 or even 0.15. And so these, and then we do a splicing dysregulation score. So it's quantified as the average absolute change in delta psi of all events significantly misspliced prior to the exercise program and then post exercise. And one of the things we, we saw from these quad samples was that there were lots of changes. In general, all the individuals are seeing a change. 907, the individual with the increase in DMPK really doesn't see much change at all. 523, the decrease in DMPK sees the greatest splicing rescue. And then what really struck us though, and this I think helps to understand why there's really not a lot going on when you do the all comparison, is that there's not a lot of shared splicing events. So there's over 200 shared splicing events that are rescued when you compare across two individuals, but when you get out to five and six events, it actually drops away. So the takeaway, if there's one thing you remember from this talk, is that the splicing rescue is unique to each individual. So if you look at this in another way, here's another view, and it's the same data, but you're looking at the unique rescued events versus the rescued events. And what you can see in the um, gray is that there's many more unique rescued events than common events. And those common actually just have to be common across two individuals. So it's not common across everyone, right? And then we also, something we think about with our small molecule treatments and other things in the cell models and mouse models, is we look at over rescue or under rescue. And so you have those in the, um, in the red and in the green bars. And actually the striking uh, data here is for individual 907 that had the uh, DMBK transcript up just to remind you, there it is, DMPK goes up, that individual has the most misrescued events. So splicing is changing in the wrong direction for that individual. Um, and then for 523, as you can see, and uh, 2005, no, not 2005, 1791, you have uh, the most events. And then we can, can quantify this. And so these are not, you know, 100% splicing rescue changes. So you quantify all this and they, they can, they're modest splicing rescues, but they're, they're significant. And so you can see when you take the, the average of those in panel B, um, that's the type of splicing we're seeing. So, you know, uh, across the board, maybe 10 to 20% splicing rescue. And we have it on a 200% 200, 200 scale because there are things that change um, greater than 100% splicing. And so we call, call those over rescue um, as well. And just not to go into panel C, the panel C is sort of the shared events, and there's certain people that share more events than others. So um, one of the things that we did with Eric many years ago now is we, from the TA, we calculated or looked at splicing events that we could coordinate with splicing rescue, and this was with Charles Well and other colleagues. And so these are biomarkers that we published back in 2016 in the Wagner uh, et al. paper. And we looked at these events, even though this is quad, we wanted to see how they compared in the TA. And again, one of the takeaways is that, you know, it is a very, very sort of individual response. And so if you just look, for example, in the, in the boxed in area of those, you can see some of the favorite splicing events where you can see there are, there are rescues. So you wanna shift back towards control. And again, some of the events are, are um, a nice rescue, some, some are modest, but then actually you can see a couple of the other individuals we included in this um, heat map that there's really only a few events changing or really no events changing for some of these individuals. So again, it's a very individual response to, um, to this strength train. Um, just again, 523 had the decrease in DMPK expression, but it's actually 1791 that has more DM or MBNL regulated events shifting back towards control. Um, yeah, and just so some of the events we of course look at, we heard from Tom about ATP2A1, NFIX, some of the others. So those are things that are being rescued as well. Um, so what's happening at the level of gene expression? So we of course looked both at splicing and gene expression. Um, we tend to in the field look, I think a little more about splicing, but I think gene expression obviously is important as well. So what we wanted to ask is, are things changing, shifting back towards say, what we consider a control or the non-affected? And so we used a log twofold change greater than two. 
and a p-value of 0.05. And again, we see this heterogeneous uh, response across the individuals, but there is um, changes. And again, if you look at the all data, which is down in panel C, again, there's a, there's a, a, a change, but it's fairly modest. But then if you look at the individuals, you can see that some individuals, there's a much greater change um, a, a rescue versus some individuals. And again, uh, 907, the one with the uh, uptick of DMPK transcript, really there's not any change. And then 523, the individual with the decrease, you see the greatest rescue. Um, so again, it's trending the same way as the splicing results. And then we can quantify this where we have just a, uh, a global uh, uh, dysregulation um, change in, in uh, differential gene expression. You can see sort of this, the, the change across time. And then actually something we were really interested to ask is, are there any, uh, do these and or splicing changes correlate with the RM1 um, measurements that Elise just told us about? And so we do see that for, when we look at the um, change in differential gene expression, that there is a statistically significant correlation with the improvements in the RM1 uh, measurements. And with the splicing, we see the trend, but it's not statistically significant. So sort of interestingly, we see a, a, a better um, correlation with the, um, with the gene expression changes. Oh, and I forgot my little animation. Um, so, yeah, so that actually, um, you know, it, there's this nice correlation. And so, you know, it took us a while to sort of figure this all out. And while we were doing these studies, um, you know, we heard about this earlier from Tarnopolsky's lab and colleagues at McMaster, and they had this beautiful study in Journal, journal of Clinical Investigations. So we thought, well, maybe we'll look at their data in the same way at the individual level and see if, see if things um, are changing at that individual level. And so, um, you know, their data is publicly available, so we were able to download it and look at their data. And so when we look again at their data, when you look at the all, as Mark just presented earlier, there may be some small changes there, but actually when you start looking at the individual level, you again see these same types of um, effects that we saw with ELISA samples. So we see that, you know, now we, and we broke it up to male and female because we were sort of interested to see what was going to happen there. And you can see um, in these studies that we see the same type of responses. So again, very, very heterogeneous in terms of the events that are being rescued. So it's not a common set of events. Um, again, you know, there's not, I don't think a single event that crosses every individual. So that's why you're not gonna see it when you look across um, pre and post ex, uh, um, aerobic exercise across all the individuals. But when you look at the individual level, you do see this, this data and it pops out um, with splicing. Um, yeah, and it's just, I guess the takeaways that some individuals, for example, number six, uh, the number of splicing events that are being rescued is quite quite impressive. Um, while number two, you're not seeing as much uh, happening. Um, so, and then I'll just say we did the exact same uh, computational pipelines and approaches that we used on Elise's data uh, samples are these samples. So it's comparable in that way. Um, again, what's happening at the level of gene expression, we see the same heterogeneous response. Um, it's again, look at, if you look at all the all comparison data, it's, it's fairly subtle, but then when you start looking um, across individuals, you see these uh, differences as well. And again, number six, we see the, the greatest effect um, in the splicing and differential gene expression rescue. And then just to sort of highlight again, those biomarkers from, the, from our previous work with Eric, you can see, I don't think I have it highlighted, but number six, is an individual here that when you look at these biomark splicing biomarkers, there's a significant rescue. Some of the other individuals was really not ha uh, uh, much happening. So it's interesting that when you sort of look down at the individual level pre and post uh, training that you see these effects. So I guess I just wanted to say that, you know, I think looking at the individual level, because there is so much heterogeneity in the, in the DM patients, and sort of understanding what's happening at, at that level is important. So I guess the thing I'll leave for this group to think about, it's something we continue to puzzle over, is you know, why are the splicing events that are partially rescued, um, there's this lack of overlap? Is it, is it because both of these uh, data sets are taken from the quad? Um, 
Would we see, observe similar effects in other muscles such as the TA? We, we, we don't know, we haven't done that study, but it's something that we're curious about. Um, and then we're, you know, something we're curious about and, and trying to think about, there's not great data out there um, that we can really mine to do this, but would we see similar uh, splicing and gene expression changes for non-DM individuals? Um, so as I said, there's significant heterogeneity at the molecular level, um, but we see uh, these interesting changes happening at the at that individual level. So uh, the as Elise alluded to, the small the female study has started. It'd be great if we had more data to look at this. Um, and so some of the things we've been thinking about is this compounded by the variability in DM, sort of where there's so much heterogeneity. It does the age, does the CTG repeat size, other variables matter. Um, and I just want to say it was it was great to hear Tom's work. And then uh, Thurman uh, Wheeler's lab also has some interesting data where they've combined exercise and treatments and showing a robust effect. So I'll just uh, leave it for the audience to think about, should we be thinking about uh, clinical trials that combine exercise and drug treatments? And I know my clinical colleagues will think uh, that's trouble. Um, and I just wanna thank, <laughs> thank the uh, folks that did the work. Lori Planko's here uh, and Emily Davey, uh, now at UF, uh, she was with us for several years, Sharon Shaughnessy, uh, Cecilia, uh, joint postdoc with Elise, and it's been a wonderful collaboration. Um, and then Eric uh, has always been a great colleague on all these studies, thinking about transcriptomics, John Cleary, and, and others, and I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thanks. Yeah, get us back to speed a little bit. The, the, the no disrespect intended for Drs. Berglund and Deshane, but um, we have strict instructions that we have to move on to the other session at 11. So we're going to have to figure out another way to get your questions in uh, so that we can get Tina Duong up here for her presentation. Sorry about that. No worries. It's okay because my presentation is all about questions. <laughs> Oh, I've been put on high heels because I'm so short, and normally I can't see. Um, but and you want to stand, basically. Right, and I'm going to stand. Gonna stand okay. <laughs> Bring this down just a little bit. I think this um, session has been really provocative, and so I'm going to actually take a little bit of a different approach. I'm not presenting you any data whatsoever, but more questions based on what we've seen and some of the common themes that are pretty prevalent. Um, today is that we see the exercise is, is impactful and seems to be beneficial and effective both, both in mice and in humans. Um, and so I'm gonna take more of a clinical trials perspective and approach to it and looking at outcome measures as I spend most of my, oops, sorry, um, days doing that. And so looking at considerations in exercise and its impact on clinical trials, First, I just want to get us all on the same page on what some of the, um, at least the American physical guidelines for activity and exercise. And this is to, you know, help the, you know, some of the audience that feel very bad about the amount of exercise they do. Um, one of the updated, um, the nice updated versions for the guidelines for Americans, I was really surprised. This is for patients with chronic disease, and they uh, suggested aerobic training for at least two hours and 30 minutes. So that's about five days a week, 30 minutes a day. I don't know how many of you are able to fit that into your schedule, but I can assure you probably our patients with myotonic dystrophy probably is not meeting that basic guideline. And so when we're in, their patients are entering into the studies um, in the basic standards of care. Are they really meeting those guidelines? And then on top of the aerobic, they, ex they suggested resistance exercises for at least two days a week. And as Mark and others have uh, said to you that resistance training is absolutely crucial, especially with aging and sarcopenia in order for you to maintain or, e or even increase uh, muscle mass and strength. Kate Eichinger and I um, worked on an exercise guideline for individuals with dystro uh, mus uh, myotonic dystrophy, which is now severely outdated with all the literature that was presented today. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize is uh, Dr. Cooper mentioned it DM being a multi-systemic uh, disease. And we know that's true. And we've also seen today that exercise has multiple impacts and that's not just in DM, but altogether uh, as beneficial for any individual. And so it could reduce risk of falling, cognition, dementia, um, energy levels. And so when you're thinking of um, outcome measures, how may this uh, 
impact your patient reported outcomes that you're using in your clinical trials or quality of life? Is the linkage and improvement of any of these measures associated with the treatment itself or that there's changes in the physical activity level? And then of course, changes in function and strength. It's been exhibited here that there is nice function and increase in strength, particularly the six minute walk test with some of the aerobic um, training um, studies, as well as the strength measures shown by Elise um, earlier. So we saw there are distinct molecular changes that are more personalized. So we really need to look at a heterogeneous, uh, with such a heterogeneous population of myotonic dystrophy, we really need to look at a personalized medicine approach. And with this, we kind of in tap need to integrate multiple outcome measures uh, with the biomarkers, but then particularly the clinical outcomes. Because when we look at clinical outcomes, that really should reflect how a person feels, functions, or survives. So there's multiple ways that we do that when we're looking at um, clinical endpoints in trials, and that includes clinician reported outcomes. And for example, the Brook or upper extremity score, um, performance-based measures such as time function tests, timed up and go. And then lastly, what I mentioned were the, um, the patient reported outcomes and QOL. So, well, well maybe that's just kind of like, yeah, I'm done. Um, <laughs> But really, that's really the gist of what what I I was uh, at, tasked by Charles to to kind of bring it all together. Uh, we know that the exercise impact. So how do we consider that and think of early on in clinical trial design as we are talking to our our ac academic and and industry colleagues? How do we integrate that into a trial to better understand the impacts of physical activity on what the clinical endpoints may be for? Uh, this uh, A study. And I know that um, Leslie Prongold is um, starting the next session and she will absolutely kill me if we don't get over there. Um, uh, I kind of mentioned this before. So, so the, I'm gonna uh, hit on the second point, which are ways to measure physical activity. What are ways that are out there to do that? We have patient reported outcomes and activity monitors. And so to drive this home, I want to just give you an example of um, a patient who has SMA. I know that's not DM, but they were on treatment. And this to me was pretty, um, pretty interesting because this patient, knowing that he's about to start treatment, decided to get really motivated and start an exercise program. You can see the Hammersmith score, which is a clinical clinician rated outcome measure. He started at 34. And then he exercised for five months. We got him approved. He started treatment. It increased to 48 before he even started treatment. So if this person was in your trial and you started at baseline, how would you know if that increase was because of the treatment or because he exercised? And you particularly would not know that if we didn't ask about it. And so then I thought was really interesting, COVID hit. And so what happened was he couldn't exercise as much. He couldn't go to the gym. And so as Mark has pointed out, and also with Elisa's work showing this is how much you can sustain aerobic capacity or strength, you're noting about six months, we really expect a decline with, with lack of exercise. He started treatment and really he pretty much stayed the same, um, even with the dramatic decrease in exercise that he had compared to before. But this is a perfect example of the things that if we don't think about, we may, we may misinterpret the findings that we have in clinical trials. And so ways to monitor, you have to look at the type, which is what activity is being performed. And that activity is going to impact what a physical activity measure, whether it's an aerobic or a strength measure, how often it's being done, how hard someone is working, and then of course the duration. So I thought this was really nice to kind of show you kind of the validity and feasibility of some of the physical activity measures out there. You can see on the X axis is the validity and the Y axis is feasibility. We, you know, the best criterion to measure is indirect calorim uh, calorimetry incredibly expensive, incredibly burdensome. That's why you don't see anybody report it, unless, <laughs> especially in neuromuscular um, trials. And so the more realistic things to do is something that's feasible, but yet valid. So where do we find the medium and we're happy with what we choose? And those will be monitor-based measurements, including pedometers, uh, uh, wearable technology. And there's a lot that's, that's happening now in this space. We need to do uh, Consider this with caution because the variability in the design of these wearables were made for persons like you and I that have changes and differences based on our body type, our skin 
tone color, all of this does impact wearables. And then lastly, patient reported um, outcome measures. We know that the feasibility is high for that, but the variability is also great. And it is incredibly labor intensive for us as researchers to constantly call the patients and say, did you do your PROs? Um, and so there should be a, um, a, a medium somewhere around there. So I want to tell you about the two primary outcome measures that, so I, I worked on this with uh, Melissa McGuire, who's in the room, looking at what patient reported outcome measures that's most applicable to our broad heterogeneous population. And a lot of times you'll see the second one, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, that uh, all of, it's great, but what we found is all of these measures, even the ones that are typically used in muscular dystrophy, really focus on people who are ambulatory. So how about the people who are non-ambulatory, which is a significant portion of our patient population? So we've been trying out the um, PADS-R or the Physical Activity Disability Survey. It has more questions on someone who uses a manual or power wheelchair so that we can encompass a large spectrum of the disease and understand what they're doing. They have similar um, methodologies. They both ask for a recall of seven days of what type of activity someone's doing, the exercise, um, including physical activity of walking, shopping, et cetera. And then they, they um, categorize it under low, moderate, or vigorous intensity. So then you can have an idea to quantify physical activity there. These are some measures. Um, I won't go into those in detail, but I'd say intensity, we don't really have any good measures that includes heart rate. Um, and I know Actograph may be moving in that direction, but we can quantify physical activity, but we don't know how hard someone's working even uh, when, they're, when they're walking. And as Mark show, has shown that when you increase that threshold of exercise, um, you may be able to do your functional task requiring less um, physical capacity. Uh, Okay. And then one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that we really need to consider a dis disease specific algorithm for some of these wearables. So when we're looking at physical activity, the reason why we want to quantify it really is because physical activity expresses how, how much um, um, energy or consumption that we're using. So the best way to usually do that is to measure physical fitness. And that's usually by CPET text testing. And that really integrates all of the ma major body functions, cardiorespiratory, musculoskeletal. And so that's what we're trying to do here. And I know that a lot of reports have shown um, uh, the exercise function being done. Good job, Tilly, 20 seconds. Oh, shoot, sorry, that's me coaching. Um, unlike the mice, I don't shock the people. Um, I just, um, I, 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 I'm more of a, 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 a um, sports coach. Um, but we, we started to use a total body trainer at Stanford to try to find a way that we can have a same mode to measure a variety of people because um, our patients who are weaker have a more difficult time getting on an upright bike and getting their maximal um, uh, uh, the capacity to be pushed. And so some of the activities that we're collaborating with many of you in the room includes um, getting better patient outcome measures for clinical trials. And so we actually designed what we call the neuromuscular disease specific uh, activity questionnaire. And that's to look at metabolic equivalents that has been used for exercise trials. There's the VSAC that was has been published and well documented by John Myers at the VA at, at Stanford. And we're kind of copying that methodology for lower functioning patients with a met level between one and four. The other one we're working on is with the NDM group led by Nick Johnson and Charles, um, in which we're looking at the actograph. Uh, one of the key features of the actograph is that it does look at sleep and it looks at activity, but our um, engineering lab has found that the actograph is highly variable, up to 40% for patients with disabilities. And so we want to get enough data to uh, put out an algorithm that's specific to disease. Um, and then lastly, another um, aspect of, of what our engineering group is doing is a wearable energy expenditure that they can wear and kind of integrates heart rate um, and activity monitoring. And this is just an example. You can stop by us around the corner. It's what we're doing today. Um, and we can give you a little bit more information. So I won't spend too much time here, but we're trying out some exploratory measures on hand myotonia with a glove and open cap for a movement study. And these are the three individuals you can find and they can definitely give you more information on that. So 
Overall, I think we need to consider with physical activity, there is rigor and time that's required for it. So if you're doing an exercise intervention study, maybe you do need more rigorous monitoring um, of the activity and intensity. But for clinical trials, this could be an explanatory variable in your clinical endpoint that you're using. So what would be impactful that, that may be associated with quality of life changes or in function that we need to think ahead of time in the design phase. And of course, as Mark mentioned, um, nutrients and supplements may also impact that. So that may be something else to consider in your trial design, um, as well as any addition to physical or occupational therapy. Because so we know that when our patients start trials, they have improved standards of care because they see us more and they get motivated. And that motivation may result in let's exercise and they're inadvertently doing their combination therapy and we don't know it. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs>